thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Sophia Itier. I am a public historian actively working in the Western Montana region. Um, so I really appreciate you all taking your time and coming out tonight and listening to me lecture about Western Montana restricted districts. Um, I'll be particularly going over Missoula and Hamilton from roughly 1870 uh, to 1917. Um, the work that I am presenting on tonight um, is derived off of my public history graduate thesis. Um, this will be a small sample of individuals that I researched, um, but the full thesis looked at uh, civil development of the restricted districts in the Western Montana region um, and their contribution to state economics, built environments, uh, and present urban landscapes. Um, it also looked at the aid these districts played in the urban, urban and civil development of Montana from territory to statehood. So this is definitely condensed from the research that I worked on before, um, but definitely you'll get a wide variety of stories, um, city development, and hopefully a better understanding of the Missoula and Hamilton that we see today, what it was over 100 years ago. Um, so, when the term red light district is mentioned, what do you typically think of? Um, mostly, what I have up here, um, we have Missoula, or Miles City working women um, with customers in this kind of first bubble right there. Um, on the top bubble, we have Madame Mustache, as she was called, Eleanor Dumont, who operated out of most notably Virginia City, but also Fort Benton. And then down in the corner, maybe one of the most famously and wide known um, madams in Montana, Chicago Joe Josephine Hensley, who operated out of uh, Helena. Um, one of the questions that I often ask people is, do you think of these as just places of prostitution or ostracized communities? One of the ways that I'm trying to transition the term red light district to restricted district is to better reflect these highly hierarchical, diverse demographic uh, communities that were ostracized by Victorian ideologies um, and politics in Montana during the territory. Um, so as you can see um, from the diagram I have here, there's actually a really hierarchical structure within these restricted districts, specifically looking at the working women. So the top we have madams, which would turn into pimps post-1917 when prostitution was outlawed. Um, then we have high-class escorts, brothel workers, crib workers, street walkers, and transients. Um, I found throughout my research that higher in the hierarchy you go, you have better pay, better working conditions, and greater liberation. The lower in the hierarchy you are, um, you tended to be lower class, lower social status, and had unfortunately worse working conditions. This was also a very fluid social structure. So depending upon your education, your ethnicity, uh, and the services you could provide, you could rise up in the hierarchy, but unfortunately, if you suffered some type of ailment, disability, um, you ran into some really rough times, you could fall down the hierarchy as well. And I will say one thing, I apologize if I do sound a little bit like a tour guide. I give this research in a tour um, through Un Unseen Missoula during the summers. Um, so that may be a little why, it's a little Tory. Um, but I also uh, came to the conclusion that many of these districts, um, red light or term restricted, were much more diverse than previously acknowledged. Um, these districts were often home to African Americans moving west in search of autonomy and freedom. Um, in the post-Reconstruction era, uh, Chinese laborers looking to establish themselves outside the Qing Dynasty, which was incredibly politically, economically, and environmentally chaotic during this time period. Um, lower class industrial laborers and immigrants, and working women who sought freedom from conservative Victorian ideologies, as I mentioned, primarily um, victimized by the religious reform movement going on between the 1880s and the early 1910s. 
Um, but one of the things that I want to take away from that is the key word was freedom. So these districts are often thought of as taboo, corrupt, uh, grungy. Um, but for these districts, for a lot of people, these were districts of freedom. They could live as they wanted to, they could work as they wanted to, um, and they could be who they wanted to be. Um, in this 1900 federal census of Montana, we do see that we have a predominantly white population, um, but we have over 1,500 African Americans primarily living in Missoula, near Fort Missoula, or near Helena at Fort Harrison. Um, Hamilton's district, which we'll get into in a little bit, is actually predominantly African American, which is really, really cool. Um, we also have about 1,700 um, Chinese immigrants living in Montana at this time period. I do see, I do say relatively, due to the fact that there is widespread bias against Chinese laborers in Montana at this time period, post the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. Um, so we don't have a great count of that reflects the true population. Um, it is thought that in Missoula County, there was around four to 500. Um, Chinese funerals could gather as close to 700, um, but the regular population was around 205. Um, this census also reflects Native Americans in the area, which sits at around 11,000. So the first town I'll talk about is lovely Missoula. Um, Missoula's red light district history basically spans between 1870 and 1914. Not quite at the cutoff of World War I, um, but actually it truly ended when Madame Mary Glime passed away. So, introducing Missoula, this district was comprised of four uh, main demographic groups, as I mentioned, African Americans, low-class immigrant laborers, working women, and Chinese laborers. Um, Missoula's district history, as I mentioned, spans roughly between 1870 or 1875 and 1917. Um, this red light turned restricted. Um, uh, we see the change in order to better represent the true nature of culturally ostracized communities that flourished under harsh conditions. Um, fun fact that I found out through my research, Missoula actually had two different districts. The first district we see is Parker's Island, which actually sits where Best Reed Park and Kiwanis Park are today, um, spanning about 1875 to 1897. And then the West Front Street District, which you might all be aware of, um, starting around 1888 to 1917. Um, so we see kind of a transition f away from Parker's Island to the West Front Street District. Um, on this map that I have up, this is a Sanborn fire insurance map, and as a public historian, I love these. Um, we can track properties, we can track um, community movements, development, um, but everywhere that you see on the map, either labeled FB or female boarding house, that was a brothel. Now in this district, along the entirety of this one West Front Street district, uh, the riverbank side, that was all mostly owned by Mary Glime. Mary Glime would own up to almost 25% of Missoula competing directly with those such as Higgins, Warden, Hammond, um, and others. Think Missoula Mercantile. Um, at this point in time, uh, essentially starting when Missoula was a territory, um, cities have been trying to get rid of these red light districts. There's multiple different ordinances in Montana legislature that tried to basically demolish these districts, um, dealing with um, houses of ill fame, dealing with um, venereal disease, but none really stuck due to the fact that these districts provided so much more um, profit than they were a nuisance, which was important when transitioning from territory to state. Yes? Do you mind pointing out which 
which of the, I can't really see the map that well, which of the, how many of these were for female boarding houses? Um, so this whole strip is going to be female boarding houses with some saloons thrown in, um, as well as this west main strip up here. Essentially, everything that you see in red or yellow and red, those are all female boarding houses. Um, we do have a Chinese store and steam laundry along here, um, where Cranky Sam sits today on the West Main uh, block. Um, that was also um, a Chinese uh, steam laundry and mercantile. Um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit with a closer up map, so, but thank you for, for asking. Um, the first red light district that I want to talk about is obviously Parker's Island. Um, this photo was not actually found until this year. As you can see, there is no M, but is Missoula still the same? Uh, per, uh, Parker's Island is thought to have been permanently settled by 1875 by Irish laborer James T. Parker and his family. Now we do see Parker's Island called a few different names. We see it's Parker's Island, Goat's Island, The Island, um, or Rotten Row. Um, districts were often called different things. Um, for example, they were called Devil's Pits, Devil's Additions, Twilight Zones, um, and Badlands, as Missoula's was called. Um, James T. Parker is thought to have been a cobbler, but at one point in time is recorded on a federal census as being a miner. Um, so we're not quite sure what occupation he held, um, but he was definitely working in the Hellgate Village and around Missoula. Um, this island was inhabited by a shanty or shack town, so temporary housing units, um, very temporary shacks, hide skin um, buildings. Um, they sat on the outskirts of the growing Missoula, just north of the Missoula Mills area. Um, it is thought that many of the working women that lived in this uh, preemptive restricted district, um, when they unfortunately died, they were buried behind their, sh their shacks in shallow graves. Um, and it's possible that the remains still remain there today. Now it is important to mention that this area was notorious for flooding, particularly in 1897 and 1908. So there's the potential that their bodies were redeposited along the river, um, but we, aren't know, we don't know that for sure. Hopefully in the future, maybe we'll know, uh, but that's for a future presentation. Um, the 1897 flood almost completely washed away the shacks on the island, um, and eventually by 1900, the island was completely cleared and residents began moving on to the island. And I say residents, meaning acceptable residents. Um, restricted residents were wiped out by 1897, and the first inhabitant was actually a Missoula police officer, Severin Thoreau. Thoreau would be followed by the Lavasser family, which the area is known for today. Um, one of the most notable residents was a Salish man named One-Eyed Riley, who created the Missoula Water Works, which was actually Missoula's first water company. Now, this is a picture of One-Eyed Riley and the Missoula Water Works Company. Uh, One-Eyed Riley would go into the Rattlesnake Creek area, fill up buckets of water, and bring them to Missoula residents and sell them due to the fact that many early Missoula residents did not actually have access to water. Now, I do mention the Clark Fork River and the water access in Missoula is really crucial to how Missoula developed due to the fact that the Clark Fork at this time actually ran right up to West Front Street and was heavily polluted. Um, we see the Clark Fork being polluted by trash, by um, chamber pots, um, and also mine tailings that were flooding out from Butte. Um, One-Eyed Riley disappears in the 1870s, and in the 1890s, uh, Warden actually owns the Missoula Water Works. So it's not sure what happened, um, but we do know that Missoula Water Works is credited to One-Eyed Riley when it was a donkey with a harness and some barrels. You can also see on this other Sanborn map, that is the outskirts of what Parker's Island was before the canal was filled in. 
so we can still see the shape of Parker's Island before it was absorbed into the East Front Street District. Um, One-Eyed Riley was not the only indigenous man to live in the area. Many indigenous people lived in the Rattlesnake Creek area after their tribes were relocated um, to reservations. Um, they provided for themselves working in warehouses or the post office that sat on East Front Street. Um, they moved freight or they often sold hides as well. Now we move to Upper West Front Street. Upper West Front Street was the more respected portion of the restricted district. Um, businesses that occupied this portion of the district wore the Mascot Theater, Daly's Meat Market, which as I might know still operates in Missoula today over on Reserve Street. We also see Sam's Cafe, which was a Chinese owned cafe from about 1890 to 1940. Um, the Missoula Pharmacy and the Capitol Beer Hall. Um, I kind of, on my tours, I kind of always equate West Front Street and East Front Street, um, West Front Street to Manhattan, and Lower West Front Street, or Upper West Front Street to Manhattan, Lower West Front Street um, to Brooklyn. So the transition from more of the higher end, acceptable restaurants, businesses, hotels, into the more grittier ethnic neighborhoods. Um, Upper West Front Street almost completely burned down in 1892, which actually resulted in the murder of C.P. Higgins, Missoula founder, um, his 21-year-old son, who was shot uh, and killed on Wepper West Front Street by a Spokane man named John Burns. Um, John Burns actually was hung after he shot Maurice Higgins, um, and his body was stolen by a secret society called the Hegis that operated somewhere near the Elks Lodge, it's thought that John Burns' feet were made into moccasins, um, and they traveled around Missoula up until 1920. Um, so we see this is a very frontier town, I think very Wild West. Um, but the district also had a notable history of burning down, particularly the Florence Hotel, which is seen in the lower right-hand corner. Um, another story that I find very interesting is that in the 1930s, when the Florence was burning down, um, the University of Mon our Minnesota football team was staying on the top floors of the Florence, and they were evacuated first because they had a Grizz game the next day. So Grizz football has definitely held a sentiment long in Missoula history. This area also was home to Missoula, the Missoula Brewery, where Highlander Beer was founded, which sits behind Stockman's and Montgomery Distillery today. Um, I do want to talk briefly about the Capitol Beer Hall. The Capitol Beer Hall was owned and operated by Austrian immigrant Andy or Anton Schilling. Um, Andy was a notorious hunter, often hunting in Grant Creek or the Waterworks Hill area, where he had a 100-acre ranch, multi-100-acre ranch, um, that actually stayed in the hands of the Schilling family into the mid-2010s, um, when it was sold to the city and turned into a recreation area. Um, but with Andy being a notable hunter, um, anything that he shot, whether it be bear, moose, elk, deer, beaver, rabbits, squirrels, um, he would send it back to Daly's Meat Market to be processed, and it was served the next day at the Capitol Beer Hall. <laughs> um, the Capitol Beer Hall was a very, very popular spot in Missoula. From about 1890 to 1911, when Andy Schilling would pass away, but it was said that at the Capitol Beer Hall, you could get a nice cold Pabst Bohemian beer, you could get a good bowl of clam chowder, you could stay the night, you could get a suit, as Andy's brother Edward was a tailor who shared half of the Capitol Beer Hall, and you can make your way on the train the next day. Um, Upper West Front Street saw two notorious murders. Um, I mentioned one, Maurice Higgins, the murder in 1892, um, and John Walters in 1898. Um, John Walters was Andy Schilling's 21-year-old uh, cook who actually saved him from being shot um, by a British Navy deserter who sought to uh, end Andy's life because he would not serve him beer. Um, on the circles here, it is kind of hard to see. This is actually the Hammond Block building. So this is the 
corner of uh, West Front Street today. Um, but we have a sign for the Capitol Beer Hall. It's the first and only sign I've ever seen of the Capitol Beer Hall. Um, we also have the Shamrock Saloon. Um, Mary Glime, who I will talk about in a minute, had a notable rivalry with a man named Bobby Burns or Cornelius P. Burns, and in 1894, she would pay two men to blow him up, uh, and they failed, <laughs> which would resulted in her going to the Montana State Penitentiary, but uh, in 1896, Bobby Burns was dynamited again, not dying, um, by a man named Irish Lord who operated out of the Shamrock Saloon. Um, I would like to tell a joke, if you're dynamited once, it's usually maybe a you problem, or it's usually probably uh, a coincidence. Uh, but if you've dynamited twice, it's probably something that you're doing. Um, not many people get dynamited twice. <laughs> or live to see the, the end of the story, that's for sure. Um, one of the most important individuals that I have found in my research uh, pertaining to West Front Street is a man named Sam Tom. Now, Sam was born on August 24th, 1852, in what was Canton, China, and he would immigrate to San Francisco in 1862 at the age of 10 years old um, by sailboat. He would spend seven months on the open ocean with his two older brothers. Um, upon arriving in California, they received word that their father had passed, and 10-year-old Sam was left in the care of a ranching family who was making their way to Montana. Um, by 1870, Sam arrived in Montana under the care of the ranching family, um, and after some time, Sam would begin working in the placer mines of Alder Gulch. Um, so he spent seven months on the open ocean, and then two years by ox train, going through Utah, Nevada, um, Wyoming, into Montana. So quite the journey for someone who's less than 15 years old. Um, Sam would hold numerous positions in Montana, including miner, truck gardener, uh, restaurateur, uh, janitor, watchman, and even the private house chef for Bankers Wolf and Ryman. Um, it's also said that he was the potentially one of the first owners of the Chinese mercantile where Cranky Sam sits today. Um, it was also noted that he could gamble between $1,000 and $1,500 in only two hours, almost $50,000 in today's market. Um, it's said that Sam Tom made all of his money while he was mining um, between the 1870s and the 1880s. Um, it's also said that any old miner in the area knew Sam due to the fact that he operated in places like Helena, Alder Gulch, uh, Butte, Anaconda, um, Anywhere around the state that had a mine in the Western Montana region, he was probably there. Um, in, so Sam Tom married um, his wife in San Francisco in the late uh, 1880s. He would move their family to Missoula in the 1890s, staying in the welcoming house in the building where Notorious PIG sits today. That building has an interesting history. The first floor was a Chinese restaurant the second floor was a brothel, and the house out back along the Clark Fork River was where immigrant families lived temporarily until they had a place of their own. Um, Sam Tom would eventually move his family to 1005 Sherwood Street, where, where the hospital is today, and he would live there till his death, and his family would move on um, in the 1950s to Butte, uh, Washington, and back to San Francisco as well. Um, in, the 19, in 1940, Sam's family is listed as the last Chinese, remaining, uh, last Chinese family remaining in Missoula, 15 members of a once 200-plus strong Chinatown. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Sam's Tom is, Sam Tom's family is incredibly crucial um, to the Missoula Chinese story as they were quite literally the last family remaining in Missoula. Um, Sam Tom would have 13 children, all living till adulthood, and also all being educated in Missoula County public school system, which was incredibly rare um, for Chinese families at this time period, as they are mostly excluded um, of all parts of society. 
Uh, the one other thing that I find really cool about the Sam Tom family is the fact that they were also invited to tea parties, garden parties, um, ladies club meetings. So really indicating that they had a high status in Missoula society in the early 1900s. Um, Sam Tom was the only person, person of Asian descent adopted into the Montana State Pioneers Organization. And his great grandnephew is still the only person, person of Asian descent that sits in the organization today, which is really, really cool. Unfortunate that we don't have a better representation, but it's still cool that Sam Tom's family is existing in Montana history, even into contemporary periods. This is a later picture of the Sam Tom family. Um, as I mentioned, this was highly unreflective of Chinese families at this time period. Uh, they would have a high class education, a high class social status, which is very different from many um, Chinese Montanans who were consistently moving from uh, Montana back and forth to China. Uh, wives could not be brought into Montana due to an 1872 Page Act that forbade Chinese women living in Montana. Um, it is thought that many Chinese women, well, it was culture perceived that many Chinese women were actually here for prostitution, which was not the case. Um, so many men would come here to work, visit families in China when they could, um, but many would never see their families uh, again, actually. Um, there is one family who owns Sam's Cafe on West Front Street. Uh, the owner of Sam's Cafe, um, Sam Yu, he would only see his wife twice before he died at the age of 70. So very, very unfortunate. Um, now we move to Mary Glyme. Mary Glyme was the mother of the red light district. She is thought to have smuggled diamonds, lace, and potentially Chinese immigrants into the community. Um, she was born on February 9th, 1845 in Tipperary, Ireland, but was born Minnie Winifred Gleason. Um, it's thought that many madams and prostitutes would actually change their names, even going from city to city with a different name, um, to avoid persecution, to avoid people following them from different cities. Um, it also allowed them the freedom to create their own identity each time they moved. Um, Mary Glyme would eventually marry St. Louis heir John Glyme in London in 1869, and the couple would immigrate to New York City in the 1870s. Now, it's interesting to mention, they met in London while both were in jail. John Glyme was in jail for stabbing somebody. So a really great start. Um, John Glyme was also notorious for his gambling and his drinking, which his fortune was actually transferred to Mary Glyme, which was thought how Mary Glyme created her empire um, in restricted districts. Um, the pair is thought to have conducted red light districts in New York City, St. Louis, San Francisco, Butte, as well as Missoula and Hamilton. Upon her death in 1914, Mary Glyme's estate was worth over 4.5 million, as calculated in August of 2023, not including the value of her properties in Missoula, Ronan, St. Ignatius, and Virginia City. Um, she would also have agricultural holdings with a ranch out by Buckhouse Bridge, over in the Blue Mountain area, and in Deer Lodge. So she was very, very uh, prevalent in many, many areas in the Western Montana region. Um, it is said that she ruled with an iron fist, John dying in 1897, Mary truly ruling her empire as her own uh, identity. Um, she was often in and out of the courtroom. She was charged with things like assault, public intoxication, and disturbance of the peace. Um, she also assaulted everybody, including those who harmed her girls and Catholic priests. So no one was safe in the restricted district. Um, she was most notably arrested in February of 1894 for the paid hit she put on Cornelius P. Burns, or Bobby Burns, who she saw as a rival because he operated one house of prostitution right underneath the Orange Street Bridge. Um, she would eventually be convicted of assault with intent to murder and be sent to the Montana State Penitentiary. Um, she would have a retrial 
Um, but when the retrial came around, all of the witnesses happened to be dead. So she never went back, never had to worry about going to state penitentiary again, and her problems were solved. Um, she would unfortunately die in 1914 when she uh, suffered the very harsh effects of the influenza. Um, while the district was booming in 1912, um, the district crumbles by 1915. So it is said that Mary Glyme truly held this district up um, and supported it. This picture is really cool because it actually shows the back of the West Front Street District. So where the water is today actually is where Karis Park is today. Um, the water lines have changed dramatically between the 1890s um, and today, with the Clark Fork actually being rerouted in the 1950s and 60s. Um, but as you can see, it wasn't the greatest district, but it was developed nonetheless. One of the other cool things that I have found on my research about Mary Glyme um, is the destruction of the district after she died. So on January 1st, 1917, uh, the district we effectively shut down due to federal law and the U.S. entrance into World War I, basing it off of the Venereal Disease Act so to prevent venereal disease, um, transferring to troops going to fight in Europe. Um, but with Glyme gone, the district was essentially gone way before 1917. Um, the picture on the right is of the notorious Glime building. If you've been downtown and been in the West Front Street District, there are two Glime buildings. Um, this is the original Glime building. Um, its back half was ripped off in the 1908 flood, and it sat abandoned and in disrepair until 1988, when it was restored by a Missoula architect. So with Glyme passing away, the district passed away as well. Um, one of the last stops that we have in Missoula is the Chinatown. Um, Missoula's Chinese incense slash Joss Temple was located on the second floor of Mary Glyme's Star Lodging House, um, which is in this first circle here, if you can see that. Um, it was a wood frame building. Um, you can actually see it slightly in this circle right here. That top portion was the incense temple. The only other incense temple that we know of that's wood frame outright in a district is in Virginia City. So Butte, Montana, which retained the largest Chinese population in the state, even had its own incense temple, but it was hidden due to persecution um, and prejudiced attacks on it. Um, the Star Lodging House is thought to have been built as early as 1890. Mary Glyme began buying property in uh, 1888 upon her arrival. Um, it is one of the only known incense temples, as I mentioned, in the area. I think it's the only one known in Hamilton or Missoula. Um, and it was one of the only ones that had a temple keeper, which Butte had one, um, but others are not known to have had one. Between 1890 and 1908, the Chinese incense temple acted as the heart of Missoula's Chinatown, especially for funerals, New Year's, and moon festivals. Um, as I mentioned, most of the lots on the main block, in fact, were developed, owned, or in the process of being developed by Mary Glyme. Mary Glyme's U-shaped brothel complex sought, sat right here, but all of her boarding houses or properties went along that West Front Street district. Um, if it was not owned by Glyme, it was definitely owned in partnership by Glyme. Um, it is thought that Sam Tom was one of the early owners of the Chinese mercantile that sat right here, so where Cranky Sam's is today. Um, as members of Missoula's Chinatown, um, this community gathered at the mercantile, which was known for selling anything from teas to herbs, Chinese ceramics, 
plates and rice bowls, silk goods, traditional uh, medicines, oils, or opium paraphernalia. Um, but they gather here to play traditional games, converse in a safe space, um, smoke opium, or gamble without the stress of persecution or harassment. It's often stated that in Chinese New Year or on moon festivals, chanting, the explosion of firecrackers, the burning of incense in the Joss Temple marked Chinese New Year in Missoula, followed by the sharing of meals that included dishes such as dates, oranges, other sweets, sesame balls, um, fried noodles, dumplings, spring rolls, particularly peanuts and sunflower seeds. Um, all of these foods were eaten, hoping to bring family, reunion, prosperity, wealth, fullness, and happiness into the new year. So while Missoula did uh, undergo quite heavy persecution of Chinese residents, um, the residents of Missoula's Chinatown repeatedly invited Missoula to come celebrate with them with New Year um, on the moon festivals. Um, they just wanted to include everybody, even if they weren't included themselves. Um, it's often seen, too, that in funerary processions, um, it's not just Chinese immigrants that are in these funerary processions, but other Missoulians can be seen walking in these processions as well. Um, most notably, in 1894, an Anaconda Standard journalist came to the Chinese district to celebrate New Year as he had heard that the New Year was absolutely amazing, an incredible experience. And that is what he wrote in his newspaper article, that he had never experienced anything like it in his life, and he probably never would again. This picture is an incredibly, incredibly cool find. As it is an 18, we think 1897, um, depiction of a funerary procession. So we do see the Star Lodging House. The Incense Temple would have been up here. Um, we see the parade of people. In that building up here, actually, today, that's where the rhino sits. So that is a historic building to Missoula, believe it or not. Um, the, temple, uh, uh, the temple was abandoned by 1908 due to the declining Chinese population. Um, but this temple allowed the Chinese population to worship their religions, usually Buddhist or Taoist, safely, as well as providing them a place where they can reconnect with their ancestors. Um, working on railroad and mining communities in the American West forced Chinese laborers and their families to be physically and ideologically separated, as I mentioned, from their homes in China and their homes in the United States. This really enforced the two-world struggle. They didn't feel like they belonged to Chinese culture. They did not feel like they belonged to American culture. So they sat in this really rough middle, never really belonging to each. Um, so, speaking lastly on Chinese funerary processions, there was two main Chinese cemeteries that sat in Missoula. One sat underneath the now residences of Cherry Street in the Rattlesnake area, um, and the other sits actually underneath the Rattlesnake Elementary School, um, which was attached yet segregated by the Missoula County Poor Farm. Um, the Missoula County Poor Farm sat in the Rattlesnake District away from the acceptable residents of Missoula. Most times, uh, poor farm residents would be those who could not care for themselves or their families could not care for themselves. Um, they were destitute or they were recovering from alcohol and drug abuse. Unfortunately, due to the conditions at these poor farms, many people would never leave the poor farm. So there was an acceptable poor farm cemetery, and even in death, these Chinese immigrants uh, were segregated to their own Chinese poor farm cemetery. Um, it's traditionally thought during this time period that to be accepted into the afterlife by your ancestors, the deceased must be buried in Chinese soil. So the bodies of those who died in Western Montana would remain there for roughly four years before they were shipped back home or were shipped with a relative returning to China. Unfortunately, many of these bodies, specifically those of the Chinese or the Missoula County Poor Farm, were forgotten about 
and refound in the 1930s and the 1950s when development started popping up in the area. Um, it's a very unfortunate story, but a definite story that we are retrying to tell in the Missoula narrative. Um, one last thing on funerary processions. Um, during these processions, mourners would carry bells and drums and chants to honor the life of the deceased. Um, but they would also carry food and candles and bedding, um, silverware, anything that the deceased might need um, in the afterlife. So the graves in the rattlesnake area were beautifully decorated and respected no matter your class in the Chinese society. Um, those that ran opium dens, like Cranky Sam, was actually given a formal Chinese funeral, even though some of his um, fellow uh, Chinese immigrants did not feel that he deserved the funeral. They gave him a funeral nonetheless, as they wanted him to return to the afterlife. So now we move on to Hamilton. Hamilton's red light district spans very, very short 1890 to 1917, um, but very, very interesting nonetheless. Um, Hamilton's restricted district, as I said, did not exist as long as Missoula's, but most certainly sustained a large portion of Hamilton's ec uh, economy through civil fees, liquor licenses, urban development, and the purchasing of public goods such as furniture, clothing, groceries. Um, the telling of Missoula, or Hamilton's restricted district uh, is incredibly important to me due to the fact that it goes away from the Daly narrative. So yes, Daly did develop the area with his mill and with his workers, but the restricted district really developed the downtown area and kept it afloat. Um, throughout the district's short existence, brothels were often raided and many of the girls were arrested not for prostitution, but for public intoxication and disturbance of the peace. We see three main demographic groups, African Americans, which was the prime demographic group in Missoula, or at Hamilton, uh, working women, and Chinese immigrants. Um, Hamilton had one district, ran both by Madams Mary, or Mammy Clara Smith and Mary Glime. Um, Mammy would be the only madam left in Hamilton after the mysterious Red Light District fire in October of 1908 that ran Mary Glime back to Missoula due to the fact that all of her brothels burned down. Now I say mysterious due to the fact that this fire happened at two o'clock in the morning after a failed city council meeting that failed to pass a law or an ordinance that would restrict the Red Light District. So if you can't outlaw it legally, guess your next option is burning it down. Um, interestingly enough, one of the only depictions of Hamilton's red light district is in an oral history conducted in the late 18, or 1980s by the Bitterroot Valley Historical Society that cites the Smith's Black Diamond Brothel as the only remaining building in the district by 1910. This is due to the fact that this brothel up here was two stories and was brick. You can't really burn down brick. Most of these brothels, which were in the main district, were owned by Mary Glime and were wood frame susceptible to fire. Um, Mammy's brothel was especially important due to the fact that we see the employment of secretaries. Secretaries were men tasked with protecting the working women who often maintain the regular facing jobs, such as bartenders or piano players, but their real job was to protect the girls of the house. Um, after the district was shut down federally in 1917, uh, Mammy would still operate business well past prohibition in the Great Depression before her death in 1936. As I mentioned, Glime did look to expand her district into Hamilton, but got quickly pushed back up to Missoula. And I will say, if you can push Mary Glime out of town, you are a pretty strong force. One of the first people that I want to mention um, is Henry Smith, Clara Smith's husband. 
Um, he was born on February 15, 1857 in Stevenson, Alabama to unknown parents, presumably due to the fact that he was born into slavery given region, time period, and lack of records. Um, Henry's recorded as working as a farm laborer until his enlistment with the U.S. Army on February 22, 1879. It should be mentioned that Henry Smith's life is very representative of black soldiers in Montana during the Indian Wars period, which Henry was a veteran of um, between 1876 and 1897. Smith would serve three enlistments with the 25th Infantry, which was an all African American regiment alongside the 24th Infantry and the 9th and 10th U.S. Cavalries, which often acted as mediators between the U.S. Army, Native Americans, and white settlers. You might most notably know them as the Buffalo Soldiers. Smith would operate, or would re enlist and operate um, in 1884 at Fort Snelling, Minnesota and then would re-enlist in 1889 at Fort Missoula. He worked in various positions after retiring from the Army in 1890 and moved to Hamilton with his wife, Clara, which he actually um, got out of the Army after marrying her. Um, he worked as a farmer, cook, and brothel owner. Um, Henry would retire from the Army before the 25th Infantry's famous Bicycle Corps journey in 1897, which started at Fort Missoula and ended in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, like many Buffalo soldiers, Henry retired to the beautiful Montana landscape, and he and Clara would virtually build and sustain Hamilton's red light district for the full capacity from 1890 to 1917. It's reported by the Revolver Republic newspaper in 1943 that supposedly Smith had written a World, One, World War I patriotic poem that garnered local and national fame. I have not found that poem. I would really love to, but it is mentioned in his obituary that he did, in fact, write that poem. Um, Henry would pass away on February 11th, 1943, at the age of 86. Um, he would pass away as an Indian Wars veteran, serving in both companies I and H as a Buffalo soldier, surveying Western Montana, acting as a mediator, and really paving the way for many, many more African Americans and Western Montanans to come. Clara Smith was Henry Smith's wife and the Madam of Hamilton. Clara Goffigan Smith was born on Christmas Day, 1855 in Norf Norfolk, Virginia, presumed to be a descendant of the enslaved population located on the Goffigan family plantation in Cateville, Northampton, Virginia. Her father, Spencer, is listed as living in Cape Bill in 1870, um, documented as an illiterate laborer, being born in 1813 and dying in 1893. Um, no known pictures exist of Clara. She also seems to disappear from the historical record from her birth until 1889, when she's recorded of marrying uh, 25th Infantry Private Henry Smith in Missoula. So between 1855 and 1889, we have no idea what happened to Clara, how she got to Montana, uh, or why she chose to come here. Um, it's theorized that Clara first came to Montana to be the Daly family's cook in Butte, and later in Hamilton at the family's Riverside residence, or the Daly mansion. Um, but no current documentation supports that. Um, Mammy would run the two-story brick brothel, which would be the only structure, as I mentioned, to survive the 1908 fire. Um, she also supposedly ran a wood frame boarding house that serviced the Bitterroot's continuously changing African-American population, but unfortunately was maliciously burned down in 1911. She also had ag agricultural holdings in Corvallis, which is where actually Henry died um, in the 1940s. Between 1915 and 1917, Following the outlawing of red light districts in the U.S., Clara would travel to Nashville and Norfolk, eventually working as a private chef for a family in Wyoming, a ranching family, potentially Henry's cousins. Um, as I mentioned, it's thought that Clara owned the brothel, which was named the Black Diamond, um, but we aren't, we aren't for certain on that. 
Um, I've never come across another name for her brothel, but the brothel existed nonetheless. Um, Hamilton would become a popular spot for prostitution due to the fact that Marcus Daly's Anaconda Copper Mining Company, his logging interests, and the stock farm brought in large numbers of single laborers looking to spend their paychecks. Um, it's interesting also, the majority of Hamilton's African-American population was comprised of Marcus Daly's uh, stock farm grooms and jockeys in 1880, or 1899 um, who ran his uh, thoroughbred racing horses. So we see a little bit of a population on one side of Hamilton and a little bit of a population in downtown Hamilton. One other important character in the restricted district is Frank Gray. Um, Frank Gray would be born on October 10th, 1889 to Frank Gray and Maddie Smith in Nashville, Tennessee. Gray is thought to be a cousin to Harry, or Henry and Clara Smith. Frank Gray's short life is highly representative of the first generation of African Americans who would not be personally subjected to slavery and would also represent the first generation of black Americans to fight for America's freedom in the world wars. In 1908, Frank would make his way to the Beirut Valley, living with Henry and Clara between 1909 and 1918. He would enlist in 1918 and would serve two, uh, two months at the Camp Lewis training facility in American Lake, Washington. He would then serve with Company E of the 18, 815th Pioneer Infantry in France. His unit was responsible for repairing transport roads which was incredibly important due to the fact that many African-American units in World War I um, were responsible for removing dead bodies rather than repairing roads. Um, Frank in the 815th Pioneer Infantry left Hoboken, New Jersey in October 8, 1918 aboard the USS Maui. Gray would be discharged from the Army on August 6, 1919 and would pass away November 26, 1936 five months after Clara, unfortunately to a pretty wicked muscular degenerative disease. Um, Frank would be buried with full military honors by the American Legion and VFW in the area, including a gun salute and a military bugler. Um, for much of his life, he worked as a porter or a janitor in Hamilton's many businesses over his 25 years living in the Bitterroot. He was beloved by the Hamilton community and in fact, he was supposed to be transported to Fort Harrison for medical treatment just days before his death. He would never make it, unfortunately. Um, interestingly enough, um, for the majority of his life, he was not known by Frank, but instead went by the name Phoebe. So it's very interesting. Lastly, I want to talk about Aunt Tish Nevins. Aunt Tish Nevins was born on the Nevins Plantation on June 2nd, 1862 to an enslaved mother who was owned by Preacher Nevins and an unknown white man whom Tish would reportedly never know the identity of. It is presumed that Tish stayed on the property of the Nevins farm with other freed slaves following the end of the Civil War until she work, went to work in the home of Robert and Martha Smythe in 1890 at the age of 28 as a private domestic servant. Um, Unfortunately, Mar Martha Smythe would die after the birth of her last child. She had 10 children. Um, and Tish would act as an adopted mother to the Smythe's 10 children following the death of Martha, um, settling with the family in Hamilton in 1899, but remaining as their domestic servant until 1908. After the youngest Smythe child was born, who particularly called Tish her mother, um, Tish would purchase and renovate an 1893 abandoned brothel on North 4th Street. If you're familiar with Hamilton and know where the creamery is, it's just right down the street from that. Um, and she would transform it into a boarding house known for its exemplary cooking and traditional Southern hospitality. Um, furthering her notable love for children, Tish would adopt five-year-old orphan Mar Marjorie Chapin in 1915, but unfortunately Marjorie would pass away at the age of 12 in 1922. Tish's restaurant was known far and wide, often having visitors from all across the US, Europe, and Asia. 
Um, Tish stood as an honor community member and was fully embraced by all Hamiltonians, both of the white and black communities, and was beloved all, especially by local farmers who she supported. She would buy her dairy products um, from the creamery. She would buy chickens from the Howe family. And after every Sunday dinner, the chicken would go back to the Howe family. She would make desserts for the creamery. Um, and she also worked with a lot of Hamilton gardeners. Um, Tish stood as a, uh, a pillar of philanthropy, community service, and service to impoverished children of the Bitterroot. Local students often stay, who would often stay with Tish in the boarding house exchanged work for food and clothing. Um, children often helped out with the dinner services, but never touched dishes as that was the time for homework and studies. Um, Tish, like many previously enslaved African Americans, was illiterate, but had an intense love for writing, which propelled her assistance in education. Many, many older Hamiltonians um, remember living with Tish or living near Tish and still talk about her um, to this day. Um, Tish would pass away in 1942 at the age of 80, but would be long remembered as doing more than any Hamiltonian to assist the underprivileged and disadvantaged. Now, just to brighten even more the memory of Tish Nevins, it's said that Tish's tables always dressed with crisp white linens and wildflowers groaned with meats, vegetables, salads, breads, and also desserts. She was known for her famous Sunday chicken dinners, buttermilk pie, and sunshine cake. The picture of Tish comes from the Rivoli County Museum, and she is standing in front of her boarding house, noted by the white linen curtains and just a very inviting um, exterior. Changing the narrative. This comes to the end of my presentation, but changing the narrative from red light districts to restricted districts fully represents the diverse communities living within these ostracized communities. Changing the narrative also provides the opportunity to tell the stories of those who never had the chance to have their voices heard. Change the narrative is not just for us, but for the censored lives and forgotten souls of Montana's restricted citizens. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you everybody for coming. What's an incense temple? So an incense temple is a room or a temple, as we see in Missoula, where Chinese citizens could go and light incense sticks and pray or communicate with their ancestors. Yes. Uh, Mary Glimes tombstone faces the railroad. Is it true that she wanted it that way so she could wave at her customers as they went by? So I have heard that a lot in Missoula history. It's, I'll answer it with this. That's actually not her original tombstone. So if you're familiar with the Pablo Allard herd that started the bison range, uh, Michelle Pablo actually died at the same time as Mary Glime. And I have a receipt that their tombstones were ordered together and they were ordered um, through George Pringle, who was the um, basically only gravestone and stonemason creator in Missoula. Um, and he ordered them from Carrera, Italy. They were made of marble. Um, it's thought that obviously marble does not do well in Montana. Uh, it erodes very quickly. And so that tombstone was actually placed there quite a while after her death. Um, so I think that a correct answer would be no, that's not the tale. Um, I'm sure that she would love to wave to her customers. Um, but I think Mary Glime with the Carrera marble wanted to be known more for the fact that she was more than just a madam. She was a businesswoman and she had a lot of profit behind it. And that, that rumor was supposedly written in her will. It is not written in her will. Her, her niece and nephew who are living in 
potentially her residences in Anaconda dealt with her estate after she died. Um, and yeah, we see a lot of mystery af in 1950 around Mary Glyme when the newspapers transitioned from writing her as a monster, as this beast of a woman, to someone who was a Missoula socialite. Um, so quickly after her death, we see the narrative change, but in a very odd way. Um, it's interesting because Mary Glyme um, in newspapers was supposedly never spoke English, was this towering woman who weighed like 400 pounds of just pure anger. Um, but actually on her intake forms to Montana State Penitentiary, she was five foot six, 120 pounds. So we see a lot of these madams in the Western Montana and around the United States, unless you were Josephine Hensley because you had the Coliseum in Helena and you had a lot of money and a lot of opulence, um, depicted as monsters um, because they didn't want people to visit the districts they didn't want people to go to the brothels or support their businesses. So we see a lot of this like myth start to revolve around them. Even after for so long, they were um, portrayed as something that they were very not, but then the changes to also something that they were very not after life. So a long answer, no, um, but there's a lot more to her story than that goes along with that narrative. Have you looked at all uh, Dumas and Butte or the brothels in Helena? Yes, so I looked into some of them. Um, the Dumas and Butte was obviously the last operating brothel in Montana. Um, one of my favorite stories from that brothel was in Butte, prostitutes could not solicit on the street. So they would tap their rings on the very large windows of their upper floors of the brothel. And supposedly, if you go in there, you can see the path they made from the window to the door to the bed. Um, one of the reasons why my research does not reflect Butte's history um, is because I feel like it has been done quite a bit. Um, and being from the Bitterroot myself, I really feel like Missoula and Hamilton get left out of the narrative quite often. Even though we were one of the prime stops on the railroad, um, and also, Missoula gave a lot to Montana's economy, especially around 1880, 1890, and 1900. Um, I've also looked into the brothels in Helena. Um, most were owned by Josephine Hensley, as I showed. Um, one of the really cool things that I found out about Helena, they also had two restricted districts. One on Wood Street, which is where Josephine Hensley operated, um, and one on Clore Street, where a man named Lloyd, Lloyd Vernon Gray operated um, the Zanzibar Saloon. And that's a whole bigger story. Um, but hopefully I'll de be developing Lloyd's story much more as well, um, aside from the Josephine Hensley, um, because his tale really represents the African American history in Helena, he actually was an entertainment manager and businessman and civil rights activist in Helena that got pushed out of Helena, um, but would actually die in Harlem, New York during the Harlem Renaissance. Um, so there's a lot of different histories. Uh, I'm kind of trying to peel back that really broad top layer. Um, so that's definitely something I hope to present more on um, in later years, but there's definitely a huge amount of history to be had there. Um, one of the other things I found cool about Helena was the Coliseum um, Theater Group was the only group to play the African American baseball team in Helena in the late 1890s. And they would play in their theater uniforms because the African American baseball players felt bad they could not afford new uniforms each season. So one of the things that kind of correlates with Helena, Missoula, Hamilton, is we see these restricted communities operating together for freedom and for survival, which is really cool. Yes? <clears throat> I believe you're <clears throat> you had a slide that said um, uh, there was a federal law uh, against uh, red light districts, and I assume prostitution. Was that about as effective as the prohibition against alcohol how did all that fare nationwide so it's actually really interesting because the venereal disease act happened in 1917 which then killed red light districts 
or what the U.S. hoped. Um, with the majority of the male population going overseas to fight in Europe, we see a large stall in the development of prostitution. Um, but this is when they went underground, and we see the change. Uh, districts lose madams, and they transition to pimps. So the pre-1917 red light district period is woman-owned, women-ran, um, female empires, essentially. And then afterwards, we see the more um, crime-riddled abuse, drug abuse, overdoses happen after 1920, when it transitions from madams to pimps. So it was effective between 1917 and 1920 of stopping it, but because there were no customers, and it forced them to go underground and not operate as they were traditionally operating. I hope that answered your question. Anything else? Oh, yeah. Uh, one last Mary Glime. I have read somewhere that she helped her employees attend the university. Is that correct? So I haven't seen explicitly that her employees were attending the university. Um, I do know that she ended up in jail a lot and would pay off the debts of the law students. If someone pays off your student loans, you probably go for them in court or, you know, go advocate for them. Um, Is that supporting education? I, you know, well, that's the cool thing because red light districts in Montana and particularly Western Montana, madams were, you know, made out to be these beasts, as I mentioned, but they regularly supported orphanages, they donated to homeless shelters, they donated and assisted uh, lonely minors getting food and being fed. Um, it's said in Hamilton that the go ring rate for grocery delivery was 10 cents, but the grocers were not supposed to deliver to uh, red light districts, um, so the women paid them a dollar. And so, yeah, they really invested in their communities, which goes into changing the narrative, um, because for a long time, red light districts have been looked at as the horrendous places, but that's really after 1920. In the frontier red light districts, every town in Montana by 1880, even if it's just one prostitute, had a red light district. So without the red light districts and without these working women who most couldn't even read, couldn't even write, we would not have the cities that we do today. Um, it's also said that many of the women under many, Mary Glime's care, um, if they were in dangerous situations, she herself would beat up men harming her girls. Now Mary Glime did have a history of also beating up her girls. Um, there's a notorious story of Mary Glyne was drinking in the Star Lodging House and a woman named French Emma came to pay her rent and Mary Glyne beat the absolute crap out of her um, with a long neck bottle and a tin cup. But she used French Emma's allegations to further uh, villainify Mary Glyne. Um, but, you know, she was really caring and gave Chinese immigrants properties to work off of. Um, the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act um, prohibited Chinese laborers from maintaining labor jobs. So one of the roundabout ways of getting around that act was owning steam laundries, mercantiles, or restaurants, um, which Mary Glyne provided the property to and supported these immigrant families. Um, so she did pay off and support education <laughs> maybe much to her benefit, um, but she also continually, as many madams in the area, supported those who weren't afraid to interact with them, weren't afraid um, to potentially work for them, um, but also did not believe these like monstrosities of myths that surrounded them. So without them, we really wouldn't have many of the cities we see today. So many houses of prostitution that you showed us, where did all these women come from? A lot would come from everywhere. Um, the only account that we know of 
that's supposed to be a primary source for prostitution um, is called Madeline. And it's a woman who is traveling from Chicago to Butte. Um, and she talks about her experiences. Um, but as we see like with Madame Mustache Eleanor Dumont, she came, um, I believe, from New York. She settled in Fort Benton, made her high profits in Virginia City. Um, so we really see a lot of these women coming from the East Coast. And as the religious reform movements really kicked up, the conservative Victorian ideologies really kicked up. Um, they followed the men and the railroads and the freedom out to Montana. And then in Montana, we would see women going between Hamilton and Missoula, Butte, Billings, Great Falls, Virginia City, um, Anaconda, at any matter of time. Um, so they could be from everywhere and also go everywhere. Um, one of the things that's interesting about Helena's restricted district on Clore Street was brothels were actually divided by ethnicity. So girls that claimed to be French worked in a French brothel. Girls that claimed to be Dutch worked in a Dutch brothel. We had exotic brothels, which was where um, usually Hispanic or black prostitutes operated out of. There was black only brothels. Um, but also with people changing their identities, we don't know a lot where they came from. Um, I say we only have one primary source of a prostitute um, due to the fact that many of these working women believe that their lives were not worth writing down. They believe that their lives were a waste and that they should not be acknowledged and no one would want to remember them, which is really sad, um, which is also why I do this work because I try to look through censuses, try to look through demographic surveys to really pin down who these women were. Um, oftentimes, unfortunately, these women would die in the streets and we would never have a death certificate. So we can't find a birth certificate, we can't find a death certificate, we don't know who they were. Um, at the conference I spoke at, the Montana State History Conference, my presentation was called Forgotten Souls because while we don't have names, we do know they were there. Any idea of numbers? No. There, yeah, when I was writing my thesis in 2022, um, there was no comprehensive survey of prostitution in the United States or in Montana. Um, so the work I'm trying to do is trying to survey the western Montana region so then we can potentially start to survey or get a good number of those existing in Montana. Um, it would prove incredibly difficult due to the fact that the identities changed, so we don't have consistent numbers. I'm not sure if you asked the same question I'm going to ask, but um, in looking at some of the census records from 1890, 1900, and I can't remember which year we lost, 1910, 1900? 1890. 1890, OK. Um, there would be uh, whole pages of Chinese immigrants listed in boarding houses. Yep. So I'm wondering if you didn't, if they were just anonymous when they came to the boarding houses, they wouldn't list anyone living there. I mean, that could be a source of identifying some of these women. Yes, so the unfortunate issue with censuses, especially with Chinese immigrants, is that there was a large prejudice against Chinese immigrants. So census takers would talk to a chief of a Chinese clan um, and write down what they assumed their name was. That's why we oftentimes have many multiple you know, men named Sam. We have Sam Young, Sam Yu, Sam Tom, Cranky Sam. It probably wasn't their original name. Sam Thomas thought to have maybe changed his name upon entrance to the United States, which is why we can track him through records. But unfortunately, after that chief is listed, it's just tally marks. Um, there are some, there are some names, and depending on cities. Um, but the, I've also seen uh, censuses say out of Anaconda or Deer Lodge. Um, where it's just that name, and then it's tally marks, uh, Chinese boy 14, say. 
Yes, my question was is if they took the time to actually document all the Chinese um, laborers, you know, railroad laborers in in the census, when they came to the brothels, didn't they do the same thing? Mm -mm. No. Um, we, I have seen some, like their name is French Emma or um, let's say Molly, um, but those identities cannot be attributed. And they also, we have a hard time counting numbers because if you take a, a census in one year and since, take a census in a brothel in Missoula, same year take a census in Hamilton, it could be the same woman. So we're not, we don't know exactly who they are. We have names. Um, I believe the woman that Mary Glimes started buying property from was a, man, or a woman named Annie Wilson. I think Wilson's her last name. Um, so we know her. She continued on her Annie Wilson. Um, but the ones who were continually listed were usually only the madams that dealt in property. Um, yeah, we see that a lot because Josephine Hensley is listed. Eleanor Dumont is listed. But the girls that they are, you know, controlling or, you know, managing, um, they're usually not listed um, because at this time, due to conservative Victorian ideology, so good versus dirty, uh, or clean versus dirty, bad versus good, um, prostitutes were thought to be less than trash, and they weren't human. Um, we, see, we see these districts called devil's pits, or devil's additions, um, due to the fact that a lot of religious reformists said that only only prostitutes would work with the devil. So it's almost like a modern witch hunt. Um, so women didn't write their tales down. Census takers didn't care to write their names down. So we see property transactions. And that's when we really have to start to dig to see property transactions real estate transactions, civil fees, liquor licenses. So we have to go way beyond censuses, and sometimes even then we aren't sure if it's the same woman or not. I hope that answered your question. OK, good. They didn't care, which is unfortunate. Do we have arrest reports for this period, especially with prostitutes? We have some in Missoula. We most notably have them in Hamilton. But they're hard to distinguish from other arrest reports because they weren't explicitly arrested for prostitution. They are arrested for public intoxication. They are arrested for disturbance of the peace. And we can't assume that all of them are prostitutes because there's always that saying of like you go on a tour of a city like, yeah, this building used to be a brothel. I'm sure you've heard that before, you know, you've been to cities where like, yep, prostitutes used to work here because it's been such a broad generalization that any woman who is living with outside the means of the private sphere of the Victorian ideology was a prostitute. Um, but that is incorrect. Um, so we can, we can look at similar names that start popping up, um, especially Hamilton because the, the population is very small. Um, I think in total, Hamilton had a consistent like 15 working women. Uh, but yeah, it's because they weren't, they couldn't be arrested for prostitution. Um, they're listed under those other crimes that also fed into larger pools of people. Uh, not every woman that was arrested for drinking was a prostitute. A lot were, uh, but unless we can find the other woman on a census, we don't know. But yeah, one of the ways that we do find um, prostitutes and their lives, we can track them through prison records, real estate records, deeds. I love property documents because we can track movements throughout regions, um, liquor licenses. Um, in some cities in Arizona in the Southwest, you had to have a prostitution license, which is how they control prostitution. Um, so they actually had to take a picture with a card that said that they were a prostitute. Um, but that is not in Montana. And so it's actually interesting to look at how prostitution varies in the frontier based on where you're at.
Um, Montana is very railroad oriented in the southwest. Um, it's very okay corral, kind of think that. Um, mining towns, Montana has a lot of mining towns, but we also see a lot of logging camps, one, one prostitute cities. Um, uh, there's a movie on Netflix. Um, oh, I can't remember. It has Benedict Cumberbatch in it. Um, but he goes to a very small homesteading uh, home town farming community, and even those had prostitutes. So we can see regions, we can see movements, but it's not exactly clear. But civil documents, especially jail, <laughs> jail uh, forms, are really cool to read. Anyone else? Um, can I just make a quick plug for cities, uh, stairs and stones? OK. Um, Paulette and I have been involved, and um, a few other folks, in Stories and Stones um, every year at the cemetery. And one of the stories I would like to research a little bit is the story of the poor farm and its history and its story in Missoula. And that story has not been told, and I think it would be really interesting. Um, the other story, two other stories, really briefly, would be one of the, uh, a map even of 1950s showing all of the gardens um, in Missoula that fed us from the Hughes Gardens to many of the um, orchards up in Rattlesnake, the potato farm up in the Rattlesnake area. How many of you remember the potato farm up there? And the other um, story I would like to tell, which um, dovetails with what you talked about was there was a journalist who happened to come to Missoula because of a relation I think and um, he his name is Edward Booz B-O-O-S and he accompanied the uh, the uh, bicycle brigade to um, St. Louis yeah he and was a reporter he was the son of a, the owner of the Missoulian he was the owner of the Missoula. He was the son of the owner. And oh, so son of the owner. They wanted him to get experience on the frontier, and they sent him on this bicycle corps, um, and he actually got alkaline poisoning in, near Nebraska. And so he wrote the story up to Nebraska, stayed in a hotel, and then caught up with them in St. Louis. Oh my gosh. Okay, that's great. Um, and then. I mean, because that would be such a wonderful story to tell. And we'll probably have the event in about an, another year. So you've got plenty of time to maybe work. We need, I would love to see these three stories told. So um, thank you for sharing that. Maybe you would like to tell the story. I'd love to. All right. Um, yeah, Edward Booz's story is, is basically, a, uh, here's a job. Go explore the West, but you're going to have to ride a 25-pound iron bike with no shock. Yeah, what I was surprised at is that he ended up here. He's in 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 our cemetery. Yeah, he he died here. That is actually going to be one of our programs next year. <laughs> yeah, a lot of the bicycle corps unfortunately suffered alkaline poison along with booze, um, but they had to continue on, and booze stayed in a hotel. So, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank it was you. great. Thank you all for coming. Just a brief note. Um, next month, you know, it's early because we're closed Thanksgiving Friday. So we have History Club the week before. So make sure you come on the 17th and not the 24th. I think that's the right date. Um, you want a little hint of what's coming up? OK. In January, Ponies and Passes is going to be about the Corps of Discovery and their horses. In February, it's the Buffalo Soldiers and Band Music. In March, it's the History of the Grizzly Bear in the Frontier. In April, it is Beyond School Marms and Madams. In May, it's um, Steam Boating. And in June, it is Suzette's going to talk about the French connection in Frenchtown. So we got a really good lineup for you next year. <laughs>
And we'll have handouts for you next month, okay?